Today, we'll feature two debates. Debate number one, proposed changes to the Divorce Act. Resolve, these changes will not be in the best interests of the children. Our two debaters are two of the uh, most prominent and eloquent family law advocates in the country. Uh, to my right is Carol Curtis, who has been involved in, in every level of court in our, in our land, in some of the most uh, contentious and sensitive areas of family law, including mobility, domestic violence, and, and sexual abuse cases. She's been a bencher since 1991 and must take uh, a huge amount of credit for uh, the creation and implementation of the new family law rules, which we all know and love so. <laughs> Thanks, Carol. <laughs> Just what we needed, three sets of rules. <laughs> to my left is uh, Tom Bastido, is one of the, uh, the finest advocates, uh, family law or otherwise, uh, in Canada, and uh, has been, was a bencher for 12 years, is one of the governors of the International Academy of matrimonial lawyers and a frequent contributor to our CLE programs. The debaters are both known for the uh, forcefulness with which they uh, express their views and uh, we are now going to uh, have the pleasure of listening to the debate uh, these changes and uh, they, this will follow strict debating format. So Carol will commence and Tom will respond, and uh, a final short rebuttal by Carol, and then we will, well, maybe we'll vote for a winner. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Carol, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right, the clock is starting now. Oh, thank you. All right, if I can uh, just, thank you. If I can draw your attention really to tab five, which is where you can find um, the material that the debate is based on. Tab five shows you, uh, includes the recommendations from the Special Joint Committee on uh, Custody and Access, and behind those recommendations, in three or four pages at the end, is the background or the media release on the background that the federal government released um, as part of their response. Um, the resolution is that the changes recommended by the Joint Committee will not be in the best interest of children. It's almost impossible for me to put this together in 12 minutes. I'm, I'm going to try, but I'm going to speak fast, as I usually do. There are at least five categories of recommendations that I suggest to you are not in the best interest of children and will not work positively for children. Uh, and, I, and in large part, that's because it, I suggest to you the Joint Committee has a fantasy that it can merely just change language and that will somehow result in changing behavior among separating parents. So I want to talk about what those five things are and I want to talk about the data that supports my position. They want to make changes to the language of custody and access. Changing the language that's used to describe post-separation child care arrangements from custody and access to shared parenting will not, I suggest to you, result in a shift of long ingrained historical and social patterns of caregiving. Even as women's participation in the paid workforce increased dramatically, women in Canada are still the primary caregivers of children in intact relationships. And when parents separate, mothers overwhelmingly retain custody of their children generally by agreement. And in fact, one recent Canadian study identifies the number at 75%. In other words, post-separation, 75% of couples, uh, the arrangement is that the mother has custody of the children. For most women, assuming childcare responsibilities after separation just continues the responsibilities that they held prior to separation. Worse, in my view, changing language will encourage disputes in high conflict families where parents look for every opportunity to do battle. We've all been there, we've all had those cases. The government's response, however, accepts the proposal to change the language and review the terminology currently in use. It does not accept the wording shared parenting nor the requirement for parenting plans and it rejects any legal presumption that one type of parenting uh, is appropriate. These are areas it says that require additional study. The second area I suggest is the need for research. This area, custody and access, is a very complicated one and the consequences of changes to the law in custody and access are extremely profound. Policy making in this area must be evidence based following a careful analysis of the existing data, not merely following the anecdotal summaries from town hall meetings. 
The bibliography in the report of the Joint Committee refers only to the material that was presented to the committee by witnesses. That's what they call you if you go and make a presentation, they call you a witness. There's a very large and constantly growing and sophisticated body of literature regarding custody and access, which was entirely ignored by the Joint Committee. There are many new articles published every month about custody and access. The Joint Committee didn't look at that stuff. They didn't commission any research on custody and access. Um, the government's response, however, recognizes that the area of custody and access is complex and difficult and one that doesn't give rise to simple solutions or solutions of, un of easy universal application. Uh, in fact, the government's response says very clearly one size does not fit all and no one model of post-separation parenting will be ideal for all children. Um, just on the issue of the amount of research that is out there and needs to be done, everyone who works with separating families imagines themselves to be experts in custody and access issues, and I must say to you, quite frankly, that includes me, and it probably includes most of you. The next issue I wanted to deal with briefly was wife assault and sexual abuse of children. Violence in families is a disturbingly widespread occurrence in Canada. I have a little data that I want to give you to just support that. It's, the data is actually quite shocking. 29% of Canadian women who have ever been married or lived in a common law relationship, 29% have been subjected to sexual or physical violence from a current or former partner. Almost half of all women who are separating or divorcing have been assaulted by their partners. And in 39% of all relationships where there was violence, women reported that children were witnesses, 39%. But to put that data another way, that means about a million Canadian children have witnessed violence by their fathers against their mothers. In 52% of violent relationships in which children witnessed violence, the woman feared for her life. In other words, the violence was so severe she feared she was going to be killed. In 61% of relationships where women are injured, they reported that children were witnesses. So, and a child is much more likely to witness a more serious assault. In 1997 and 98, over 90,000 women and their children were admitted to shelters across Canada. The report, however, was almost entirely silent on, on uh, wife assault and sexual abuse of children, which I suggest to you are the two most detrimental and significant issues facing Canadian children. Only inferentially did the report deal with either of these issues, and really only by referring to sort of, you know, the false reporting of wife assault, which we all know goes on. Uh, that's sarcastic. <laughs> um, the report actually attempted to deny the existence of wife assault and sexual abuse of children. Courts cannot assume that women and their children are safe after separation. In fact, the data shows us the exact opposite, um, that violence escalates when the, man, the assaulting man fears that he will lose the woman, and that this is the point when women are most often killed by their spouses or partners. Now, luckily, the government's response to that was to accept that um, the level of conflict experienced in families can vary wild, widely, and that as a result, no one model of post-separating parenting is ideal for our children and the government specifically commits to strengthening efforts to protect children from violence and from threats of violence, including an evaluation of whether new legislative provisions are necessary to do this. The fourth topic I wanted to deal with is access to justice. Um, I submit to you that proposals which remove or interfere with access to the courts should be rejected. For example, mandatory referral to mediation, mandatory mediation, mandatory parent information programs before an action can be started or an administrative family law dispute resolution agency. These proposals will result in the increasing privatization of family law with no accountability, no consistency of treatment, and no jurisprudence. <laughs> um, the government's response luckily recognizes that divorcing, divorcing spouses experience different levels of conflict and commits to re-examining the family law justice system to find uh, ways to provide dispute resolution mechanisms suitable to all different levels of conflict. And then the fifth issue, is access disputes. Um, the report has a very skewed vision of the place of conflicted or denied access in the family law system. And I must say that I give a lot of credit to the Canadian Bar Association nationally, who made a very strong submission to the committee that access disputes do happen, but they are a very small part of a family law, uh, the family law continuum. Um, there may be some conflict in the immediate post-separation period, but we all know from our experience that generally parents settle into some kind of routine with the passage of time and access disputes are most often resolved as they flare up, either by the parents or with the help of lawyers. However, in some families, the level of conflict continues without change for years following the separation, and there may never be a time for those parents where there is no conflict. Um, and, in, and 
also in families where there is violence, there is really no way, frankly, to fix those problems. Um, the government's response was to commit to working with the provinces and territories to try and develop a strategy to deal with conflicted or denied access. Now, when I was trying to narrow this down to five or six recommendations to talk about, it was completely hopeless. You know, there's 48 recommendations and there's a huge paper from the government about it. Um, but I did want to say a couple of things about the committee. I think I have about three minutes. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, <coughs> the, the, gover the, the committee's process was deeply flawed. It, it was, as I said, it was town hall meetings that uh, were held across Canada, which were not conducted in a business-like fashion at all, were re repeatedly taken over by members of the audience, uh, generally men, who heckled and disrupted. Uh, so I suggest to you the value of the recommendations are suspect. But in any event, the government's response is very clear that they are not adopting these recommendations as policy, but rather are agreeing to consider them in a consultation process. I also want to talk to you briefly about the assumptions that some of these recommendations are based on. Um, and I have a lot of data to support these assumptions, and I want to tell you about where I got the data because it affects its reliability. Uh, much of the data I'm going to refer to about custody and access is from, was collected for and used in the Supreme Court of Canada in the Gordon and Gertz case. Um, and I'm in eternally grateful to Susan Boyd's work and scholarship to collect this data. Um, in any event, the data tells us a lot about post-separation parenting. I'm going to try and get through it in three minutes. <laughs> the majority of studies based on large national surveys have found little association between father visitation and children's well-being, which I recognize is not what the two speakers before me said this morning, but it is what the data says. Studies set out to determine whether the effects of non-resident father involvement on, ch on children's well-being varied in any way by race or mother's education or whether the child was uh, a child of married parents or not. And, and often the early research was predicated on an assumption that father involvement would have positive benefits for children. Um, also there's data about the advantages of joint custody and whether it produces a better parent-child relationship. Thank you. The answer is that has not been established. Um, the research found no evidence for improved parent-child relationships in equal custody households. In fact, the research found that the level of parental disagreement is actually more important than the kind of custody arrangement in determining what kind of parent-child relationship there was going to be. Um, the, the data also shows that there's a tendency to exaggerate the importance of the intact nuclear family and to assume that any disruption of that pattern post-separation is going to be detrimental to children. Uh, one large American study uh, found that a majority of children of divorce have had no contact whatsoever with their fathers in the last past year. This is the way it breaks down. One child in six, 16 percent, had seen the father in the, uh, had, excuse me, had seen their father once a week. A similar statistic, 17 percent had seen their fathers once a month. 15 percent had seen their fathers at least once a year. The remaining 52 percent had had no contact in the past year. And of those, 36% of the total sample had had no contact in the last five years. Um, so father absence in and of itself had not, has not turned out in the, in the literature to be um, as significant as many people imagined it would be. Um, also, there is an assumption in the committee reports that where access has diminished, the problem is somehow with the custodial parent who is interfering with access. The reality is that access parents simply do not necessarily exercise their access. So I'm closing. I'm closing. I've got two things to say in closing. <laughs> One is um, I went to a conference in Vancouver in the spring where the Joint Committee's report was presented by Landon Pearson, who was one of the co-chairs. And there were three expert commentators on the report from three different countries uh, commenting on the recommendations. I must say that Chief Justice Nicholson, who's, who's not here today but who was supposed to be here, was one of the commentators. A divorce lawyer from Texas was one of the commentators. And a, and a legal academic, uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, a legal academic from Newcastle on Tyne was the third commentator. All three of the commentators read the recommendations of the Joint Committee and said very nice things to the group about the recommendations. But all three of these people, Texas, Australia, and England, said, we tried it, we changed the language, it didn't work. In fact, in Australia, they had an explosion of litigation. That was the word that Chief Justice Nicholson used, an explosion of litigation following it. So, in summary, the Divorce Act is not perfect, it's far from perfect, but it ain't broke. Um, it is unrealistic and naive, I suggest to you, to think that changing the law will result in solutions to all of these problems, some of which are simply unsolvable. 
Inveterate conflict is not the case for the majority of separated Canadian families. Custody and access laws need to be crafted to handle the majority of situations, not those faced by a small group. And family law disputes, as everyone in this audience knows, often involve very complicated problems which cannot be resolved with simple solutions. Thank you. Tom, what do you have to say about that? It's, it's simply inevitable that the Divorce Act is going to be changed, and I could only think of Queen Canute sitting on the shores of Kent watching the waters try to advance as she told them to disappear. It's going to happen. Let's cooperate in a structure which is going to be good for our children and our families. And the, exactly the same arguments were used by those in 1989 in England and in, in the early 1990s in Australia. The fact of the matter is there's been a paradigm shift in the cultural operation of our society which has resulted in a shift from parental rights to parental responsibilities. It is being mirrored in a series of legislation and jurisdictions throughout the world. It is going to happen here and I wish to tell you why it should happen here. In 1989, the Children Act in England brought in a structure which depended on the one hand on residence and on the other hand on contact and eliminated custody and access. I was struck by the comments of Professor Bala and Ms. Freeman this morning on the use or setting aside of the word access because the word contact is designed to deal with the relationship between the parent and the child, which goes way beyond what used to be called access in our society. It is this shift of parental rights, from parental rights to parental responsibilities, which is reflected in the government's response. And I disagree to some degree with the interpretation Ms. Curtis has put upon the government's response, but in part that's not her fault because the uh, response is somewhat vague and wishy-washy. However, the government does say that they will explore the means to shift the current focus of the family law system from parental rights to parental responsibilities, and those responsibilities, as we've seen through several different speakers today, are directed to be met by the parents as they develop plans for their children. This is the keystone of the structure of the statute. Now, over the last generation, the entire family law structure in our country has changed. As has been pointed out, we have had a shift in property legislation, a shift in maintenance legislation, a shift in legislation dealing with all aspects of our family law except perhaps the most important shift that is in the relationship of parents to their children. And there is a reason for this because, as Professor Bala pointed out this morning, over the last nearly 200 years, there has been a fight in the law in uh, England and Canada at the attack by equity on the strictures of the common law, which gave children to their fathers as a matter of right. This culminated in the best interest uh, test that we've heard about, which was reflected, I suppose, most laterally in the Infants Act, in the English Guardianship of Children Act, and came to a peak, I suppose, in the Bell decision, which um, Professor Bell has cited. What has happened now is that the spectrum of rights has moved from the custodial rights which had been given by the common law to the fathers over children to an attitude on the part of speakers who are, rep uh, of persons who are represented by Ms. Curtis in a ideological sense, give that structure of rights to mothers. And <clears throat> that situation now has come to an end as our society itself recognizes, as the Family Law Act does in its preamble in 1986, that parental responsibility is a joint effort to be given on the part of the government as an imposition to both parents. This does not mean that the concerns which Ms. Curtis so correctly and clearly set out are going to be ignored. 
It does not mean that there are going to be rigid access arrangements in all families. What it does mean is that there will be an attempt by both parents to exercise responsibilities. Now, I accept, and it is true, that in the cultural imperatives which have given rise to legislation like this, that the legislation is not introduced in response to any problem identified in the social science research into children's adjustment to parental separation. And that quote comes from my colleague, Ms. Harrison, who will tell us in some detail what happened in Australia. And that has led to the attitude which has been so clearly expressed by Ms. Curtis that if it is broken, don't fix it. And therefore, there should be no rules. The problem with this that we've moved way beyond that structure in our normative society today. And the only issue is whether or not we are going to cooperate in putting form a type of regime in which the obligations of parents to the children will be recognized and in which government will take a hands-off position so as much as possible. Now, what can we agree upon? What can we agree upon that was personified by this admittedly imperfect report. And I accept most of the uh, criticisms that Ms. Curtis has made of the Senate report, but that does not displace the fact that the report says a lot that we have to heed. First of all, as we've heard at length today, the impact of divorce on children is significant and harmful. The best interest of the children test is vague and is fact-driven. Women are the primary caregivers. Violence is a major problem in the context of separating families. Interspousal, separating, interspousal fighting is toxic. The loss of a parent to a child is important. Is it so trite to recognize the, all, all these things in a sort of homiletic way, which is uh, <clears throat> the way that this report was written? Professor Bala, in an excellent article in the latest Journal of Family Law, said that one of the reasons for the confusion and the lack of rationality in the report is that the commissioners did not know how their report was to end as their assistants were instructed to write it. However, if you look at the other evidence which was given to the commissioners, and particularly the evidence of such as Howard Irving, Divorce Act is replete with language such as custody and access which reflects a bygone era in which women and children were legally chattels in the possession of the head of the household, the father. Instead, the language of the Act should reflect the modern era in which all family members have rights with both parents equal before the law. Now, those, that phraseology is phraseology should, which is routinely accepted now in the last generation of the practice of family law in this province. And it is a little help to any of us to say there are all these reasons why the, the um, language shouldn't be changed and there are all these reasons why it won't work. Now I say to you that there are new rules which should be brought into effect. Perhaps not a lot more help can be given to high conflict families and I was very impressed as we all were with the speeches we heard this morning with respect to high conflict families. However, I believe that there can be an attitudinal change in language and that this attitudinal change is important. We are, yet as, we are as yet uncertain as to the input of this language. And I should tell you that the studies in England which have been done over the last 10 or 11 years are ambivalent about the impact of the language. But I can tell you in my own practice that it is rare now that in difficult cases, the words custody and access are the ones that at least the lawyers start out to negotiate on. There is an uncertain impact on whether or not there is an increase in time with the non-residential parents, and it is probable that the new rules have not had an impact on increasing the time that non-residential parents spend with their children. However, there is an emphasis in parental responsibility and all language is as hortatory as this can only help because we see in the day-to-day in the -day practice of family law 
that the emphasis which we all have in our agreements on residence orders and contact orders, however one might be describe them, have an impact on the curative effect of negotiating and resolving disputes in our family, our families. However imperfect the language in this report is, however imperfect the background and the type of hearings which were conducted, this report contains the kernel of what is happening in our society today. As Ms. Curtis has pointed out, it is open to persons like you and me to make representations to put this into a final form. And I do not agree with her that the government's response was wishy-washy, uncommitted, or uncertain. In my respectful view, it is certain that there are going to be changes, and it ill behooves any of us to simply say that because 52% of fathers do not see their children, that nothing can be done about it. These, stat these statistics can be drawn from any source, from any document, and I agree that the language of the statute may not necessarily have an impact on what is going to happen for the good of their children. But I also agree that this debate, which is the first worthwhile debate that has occurred in this country, is going to be highly important for the last area of family law which is going to be altered. Do you realize that the English Commission took place in, the Chancellor's Commission took place in 1988, 12 or 13 years ago? The Lord Justice Ward of the English Court of Appeal and his colleagues went to Australia in the extensive hearings which were brought in to bring forward the Australian statutes. That it is not true that there is no uh, other extant information on this. Uh, the report sets out Michigan and one other state for experiments in bringing these uh, <coughs> recommendations into focus in our Western society. And I believe that it does little good, except in the focus of this debate, to be like uh, our other famous king, King Canute, who sat there when the waters subsur submerged him and he passed into oblivion. Carol, three minute rebuttal. Yeah, I, I'm actually, you know, very interested in the comments um, that are going to come from uh, the, our Australian expert, and so I'm going to be very brief, and perhaps Jerry might give Tom and I a chance to respond to her when she's finished, uh, because it would be very interesting to hear that. And, and really, in response to Tom's uh, comments and to Tom's tone, <laughs> which was a little dismissive and disrespectful, frankly, um, the, the notion that there's an emphasis on parental responsibility by changing labels is not borne out by experience in other jurisdictions. Um, I agree with Tom that it's difficult to understand exactly what the government is saying, but the media release is not the entire picture, of course, and I meant to refer it to you in my opening remarks. You can get the full report from the government's website, although both Tom and I found it not easy to download from the website, and you may need to phone the phone number in the media release for somebody to walk you through how to get the full report. Um, again, I go back to the premise that the legislative uh, proposals are based on an assumption that legislative change can bring about change in the behavior of parents. The goal of all of this is presumably to change behavior. Perhaps it's the goal of much of what we do. Um, and again, it's also premised on assumptions about custody and access that are simply not borne out by the empirical data. So I would uh, also, I just want to remind you, this is not legislation. Tom did suggest at one point that this was legislation. This is the report of a joint committee with a response from the government that gives the government's official position to that report. There is no bill, there is no legislation. We're not near there yet. Thank you. Well, uh, as co-chair, I can be uh, arbitrary and I'm going to do that right now and declare that this uh, debate was a draw. <laughs> and then run for cover. Uh, thank you both. Thank you very much.
Margaret uh, Harrison is here from Australia. Margaret is uh, the senior legal advisor to the Chief Justice of the Family Court of Australia, Alistair Nicholson. Uh, the Chief Justice is not here today, uh, unfortunately. Margaret will explain why he's not here. In the uh, material, you'll see a paper that's been written uh, by Margaret, which deals with the Australian experience that you've heard so much about this morning. And with that, uh, I'll introduce you to Margaret Harrison. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the Law Society of Upper Canada for inviting me today, and I do apologise for Chief Justice Nicholson's absence. His wife got quite ill a few days ago, and uh, he delayed and delayed making the decision, but ultimately he really felt he couldn't leave her. And I told him that if it was my husband uh, and I was sick and he was going to Canada, I would never speak to him again. So uh, <laughs> he, uh, he's in Melbourne. It's also four o'clock in the morning um, Tuesday in Melbourne. So if I sort of slight, you know, become slightly incoherent, it's not alcohol, it's not too much Chinese food last night, it's probably jet lag. <laughs> so I'm entering the debate. <laughs> that I've been very interested to hear. I have certainly read your Canadian report with interest. Our Australian Family Law Reform Act came into operation in the middle of 1996, so we've now had three and a half years, obviously, experience of it. It was hailed by the government of the day as ushering in a new era of family law. So it didn't come without a lot of expectations, at least from Parliament. The reforms are intentionally based on the private law provisions of the English Children Act, um, with some particular Antipodean features, and I do mention some of this in my rather lengthy paper that you, you have. Uh, the Reform Act replaced a very large chunk of our Family Law Act, uh, what we refer to as Part 7, which includes all provisions relating to children in private law disputes, uh, not care and protection over which our court has, family court has no jurisdiction. Um, it also, of course, sometimes involves third parents, such as parties such as grandparents. Uh, the first slide, please. As usual, we probably won't be able to fit everything on the one time. I think the person who did the overheads was a bit ambitious. But um, this does explain the object of the legislation. Um, there's another bit at the bottom. So it, it's to ensure that children receive adequate and proper parenting to help them achieve their full potential and to ensure that parents fulfil their duties and meet their responsibilities concerning the care, welfare and development of their children. So. We do have an emphasis on parental responsibilities uh, and not parental rights, as was mentioned um, before, and as, of course, the Children Act in England does as well. Uh, the next one, thank you. Before the law came into operation, we had uh, fairly simple, I guess, uh, provisions that each parent actually was a guardian of their children and both had joint custody unless a court was to make an order that varied that in some respect. The next one, thank you. Uh, under that definition, custody was the right, well, we did have rights in those days, and responsibility to make decisions concerning the daily care and control of the children, child, and guardianship, as you see, refers to the longer term decision making. These would usually include decisions about education, non urgent medical procedures, and, and dent, uh, medical and dental treatment, and religious upbringing. Following a trial, as Nicholas mentioned before, in relation to orders for joint custody, it was common for each parent um, to be awarded a joint guardianship still by a judge, but the, the considered feeling was that you wouldn't order joint custody after a trial because the very fact that a trial had occurred indicated a lack of parents being able to operate cooperatively as parents. Next one, thank you. We have pretty low litigation rates, although somebody told me last night we were a litigious society. About 5% of applications for children's matters or for property end up being resolved by a judge. Uh, we do, and I'll mention a bit later, have quite a few interim hearings, and we also have a certain proportion of people who make their own arrangements but prefer to file those in court as court orders, but they are actually consent agreements. Um, so th as litigation was uncommon, as the slide says, the majority of people actually did continue under the previous legislation to have joint guardianship and joint custody of their children. Now, in terms of joint custody, of course, this was pretty unrealistic as you don't make day-to-day -day decisions about uh, children when they're usually living primarily with one parent. There was obvious confusion about the law, and it, there was a strong men's group lobby which complained that the court was biased towards uh, women and that the parent with the child essentially controlled the shots. 
uh, it was apparently such complaints that the Family Law Act, uh, Reform Act, was intended to uh, in some way address and minimise. I think you've had fairly strong uh, men's groups um, lobby here as well. Now, under both um, the Family Law Act and as it's amended under the Reform Act, um, the, ch the family court must regard the best interests of the children as being paramount. Um, the wording was slightly different under the previous act. It was the welfare of the children that had to be paramount, but there was no intention of changing the substantive law with the Reform Act in this regard. We were really following uh, the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child and bringing the law into the wording into alignment with that. However, the Reform Act di did add to the list. Um, we have a list of factors that the judges must consider when they're looking at parental, um, making parental orders, and we did add some factors there, particularly those relating to violence in children. There were, were always some there, but we made it clear that witnessing violence was relevant and family, any family violence orders was relevant to the best interests of the child. When a judge um, writes a judgment, he or she must um, refer to those factors, but uh, the weight that they give to them is, of course, um, up to them, so we still have a reasonably discretionary system. The factors that I've got here are actually abbreviated. Um, I haven't spelt out every one. Um, there's another overhead that you'll see in a minute, but they're fairly uncontroversial, I think. Children's wishes are not given directly to the court. They are usually obtained via court counsellors or in other more subtle ways. Um, and the other factors which are on the overhead and the next one, as I say, are guidelines, but each one has to be referred to in a judgment as to whether it's relevant or not. So at least um, the families involved do get some sense of what is intended by the, the provisions. But as I say, there are actually 10 or 12 of these set out in much shorter form. I probably made it more difficult by trying to uh, bring them all together. <laughs> There's the interesting one here is another one that was added by the Reform Act, the, the connection that the child might have with the lifestyle, culture and traditions of Aboriginal people or Torres Strait Islanders. We've had some in interesting and a little bit uh, disappointing outcomes in relation to our Indigenous children in the past. And this is a bit of a directive to the judges to at least be a bit more sensitive to the other values. So that's where we were and a little bit of where we are still in terms of best interests. But getting to the actual Family Law Reform Act, there are the main changes are the principles that are set out here. Uh, we have A and B and on the next page you'll see we have some others. So these have become quite controversial and as I'll mention later, they're fairly inconsistent and confusing. confusing. The right of children to know and be cared for by both their parents, regardless of their marital status, etc., etc., And the right of, of contact with other people in the child's life who are significant to them. That parents should share the duties and responsibilities concerning the care, welfare and development of their children. And of course, that they should agree where possible about the future parenting. In relation to C, the, the sharing of parental duties and responsibilities, there is no guideline or explanation in the Act as to how that might occur, whether it may perhaps mean shared residence, although I'm cl it's clearly not. Uh, it could be shared caregiving or perhaps shared decision making. If the last one is so, that's the shared decision making, um, there's no clear um, solution as to whether this requires consultation between parents or whether the decisions can be made independently during a contact visit or residence during residence. So there certainly are some issues, and when we, I'll, I'll get onto the research project later, but when we interviewed some of the judges, there were some quite scary um, differences in their attitudes in the first few months of the ex operation as to how they would interpret some of these fairly basic principles, which then you know, become relevant in some of the provisions later. Uh, number two of the changes is to terminology. Now, in effect, this is not absolutely important, I don't think. Um, we now have a single concept of parental responsibility, and we have the orders, as you can see there. Um, we have um, residence orders, specific issues orders, and contact. These, um, as I say, have certainly were really one of the major reasons why the Act was said to have been amended and was the part of the legislation that attracted the most publicity at the time. I'll get onto that a little bit later, but uh, they haven't proved to be quite so significant. I think more importantly are, is the fact that the, the orders, the changes are not just semantic, there are changes to court orders. 
uh, a parent with a residence orders order doesn't have any decision-making power transferred to her or him. Um, there's no removal of the resident parent's child-related responsibilities. All it does is say that the child will live with such and such. So for any other variation of that to occur, any what we used to have as guardianship, uh, for example, a specific issues order has to be obtained to spell out those details in some clar fairly clear and enforceable way. So the new law really severs the nexus between caregiving and parental authority. Both parents have equal powers, responsibilities and authority over their children, regardless of whom they live. Now you may ask, as many of us do, as to whether this has any real meaning and whether the law is trying to change um, behaviour in a situation where probably pre-separation these responsibilities, etc., were not uh, shared in any way. Uh, the third factor, the third change is a range of pr provisions aimed at encouraging parents to use mediation and conciliation services and counselling. The Family Court has always had a counselling service as part of its um, primary dispute resolution armoury. We've ad added mediation to that recently and counselling and mediation are also um, quite widely available in the community as long as you live in a pretty large city, I guess. Um, but the Family Law Act has always had this thrust and this is partly the reason, I think, why we have quite a few settlements in parenting disputes along the way. We have some very good people who help us resolve that. Now, the fourth point is parenting plans. Uh, these are not the parenting plans so much that you've heard about this morning. Um, they are written agreements about the future care of children uh, and the idea originally was that they would be very similar to what you've heard about today, that parents would um, arrange themselves how, they would, um, how their children would live, hopefully with some input from those children. This would prevent litigation, etc. What happened when this got to the Senate was that the Senate decided it was much too sort of sloppy and unformed and they put in this requirement that they had to be registered. A parenting plan had no effect unless it was registered, in which case it had the effect of a court order. Now, I will show you some figures in a minute. Parents, of course, are turning away from this um, proposal in droves because uh, it really has got um, quite out of hand in terms of the formalities that are required. Now, I'd like to look now at what the effects have been on the, of the reforms on families and relevant professionals. I've been involved with two colleagues, Reg, Reg Graycar and Helen Rhodes, in a project with an incredibly long name, which I, you can see on the overhead, um, which we had to set out to get funding from the Australian Research Council. Um, we've been doing this since 1997, uh, examining the impacts of the new legislation on the people who, for whom it is relevant in some way, either as the family is concerned or as a variety of professionals. And you'll see there what our aims in doing this were. I won't go into the boring details about methodology, but we have looked at this in every possible permutation and way, I think. We've interviewed all the law as many lawyers as we can. Uh, we've gone right around the country interviewing the judges, the registrars, our court counsellors and others, people, uh, women usually working in refuges. We've had a look at unreported and reported judgments. We've combed our way through the court statistics. And being Chief Justice Nicholson's uh, associate, I do have access to a lot of figures that maybe no, are not quite as available to others. And uh, we've talked to a lot of people who are involved with legal aid. We re released an interim report this April and, and next March we hope to finish off the project with a final report. It's interesting in family law, and I'm sure it's the same with you here, that nothing is ever static wherever you look. Not only do we have the reforms, but in 1996 the Family Court introduced simplified procedures for court to make it much easier for people to get out of the system and to sort of really weight everything at the beginning of the proceedings so that there was a much more uh, accessibility for counselling, etc. We also at that stage had very draconian legal aid cuts uh, right across the Commonwealth as the, um, the budget was uh, slashed quite considerably. So the impact of this has been, I think has also had an impact on our uh, look at the Family Law Reform Act. Um, we've got many more litigants in person, 35% of people appearing all the way through the process, including at the appeal level, 35% uh, of those cases either one or both parties are unrepresented. This has contributed also to quite serious delays in our court um, right across the country and in some cases I hate to say we have delays of um, 18 months uh, before a final hearing in a children's matter. So this in turn has put more pressure on what we uh, on interim parenting um, hearings before reg senior registrars and these as I'll show you have actually had quite serious outcomes, I think, for children, which really makes one question the best interest uh, test. Interim hearings are, as I say, conducted by senior registrars. At that stage, there's no opportunity to test evidence. There's usually a two-hour rule, um, so you're dealing with affidavit material. 
which, as some of the people in our survey said, really goes back to who's drafting the affidavit and how professional are they, not necessarily the issue that's involved. So we have some serious problems um, that are, I can't source all back to the law reform, Family Law Reform Act, but I think it's not making it any easier. Uh, the major research findings, the next overhead is going to be a bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, this is the explosion um, in litigation that was referred to. dirty, is it? Oh, I'm sorry. It's pretty dirty information. <laughs> um, what I haven't done here is, before the Reform Act came in, I haven't looked, I haven't put custody and uh, guardianship in any shape or form because they're not the same, as I said, they're not the same issue. They're, they're different. It's not just change in terminology. We have different concepts. But what, what we have here is access and contact, which are the same. I mean, I don't think there's any difference between what we see as contact and what we used to see as access. Um, now, the, the obvious um, conclusion there is that we've had quite a dramatic increase in applications for contact. When you look at the post-reform act bit on the right-hand side as well, you see we have, within that period since the act came in, increasing numbers. These are applications, not orders, but they are also reflected in increased orders. We have increasing number of applications for all child-related matters. So this not, just doesn't just mean more, well, it means more delays because, of course, it's much more workload for the court. It means more frustration. And it means that potentially more people are getting into that litigation continuum. And some, as I said, are going through and the orders are increasing as well. So all we've heard today is that litigation is not in the best interests of children. This seems to be something that is um, really quite serious in terms of the Australian Law Reform Act. It also was evident in, a, in England when the Children Act came in I think the bulge started to drop off a bit before ours isn't showing any signs of reducing. The Children Act, I think the, um, they do have a no order principle as well, which we don't have. But um, you can see our court is quite concerned about the additional workload and the impacts on kids. So I don't have the figures for orders, they're a bit harder to work out, but um, you know, it's, it's certainly there. What we're also seeing is uh, more parental dis disputation in, in applications for contravention, usually of contact orders, usually by fathers, usually unrepresented, often not successful because based on some fairly um, slight issues as to whether the child was returned at six o'clock or seven or whatever. Um, now this also, I think, going back to be fair, is, is a problem with legal aid being withdrawn, people have to represent themselves. It, there's a certain amount of ammunition there. Specific issues orders aren't helping because sometimes they're making quite detailed com, um, sort of provisions for post-separation parenting. So we have a sort of atmosphere which is ripe for dispute and which, as you can see, the dramatic increase from 786 in, when the act, in the middle of when the act came in to 1,765 per year of these matters. Uh, some of them are driving the judges absolutely crazy, and there are many of them that repeat uh, time and time again. Now, getting back to parenting plans and remembering that these are not the animal that, uh, that you're hearing about here, uh, the, they're not being used, uh, they're not being registered, the registrars don't like them, and quite often knock them out for some technicality, so that doesn't help, the word gets around, and uh, they're not uh, very useful. Now, I'd like to... I've got no idea of time, but I, okay, fine. I'd like to talk a little bit about an issue that is particularly important for best interests. And this is what we have with our uh, legislation. If you remember, we've got an emphasis on the child's right of contact with both parents. We have increased references to violence um, and the child's right to be protected. And we have this overriding objective that parents should share the parenting of their children after separation. Now, I would argue strongly, and the evidence from everything that we've seen suggests that this is so, this is contradictory in itself. Uh, when we interviewed many professionals, including judges, um, within the first nine or six or seven or eight and nine months of the Act's operation, very many of them weren't aware of a lot of the family violence provisions in the Act. They were all aware of the right to contact. And so what's happening here is that there's been a dramatic, dramatic decrease in orders for no contact at interim hearings. Now, interim hearings are usually 
precipitated by some quite serious concern about inappropriate behaviour or, more commonly, violence. Uh, and this is where the cutting edge of the, the abuse and the, the, the violence that we've, we hear about so regularly comes out. Because of the delays in the court, many interim hearings become actually final hearings mm -hmm. because people do not want, nor can they, wait 18 months for a trial. And once, unless something really disastrous happens in that period between interim and final, there's really no point in continuing. So an interim hearing in Australia, and I'm not sure about here, is a very important event, although, as I say, it's on the papers and it's usually the subject of a two-hour hearing. I'd just like to show you, when we looked at the the judgments, the unreported judgments, um, before the Act came in, just the, the year or so before the Reform Act came in and afterwards. That's before, yeah, okay, that's fine. Pre-Reform um, Act, at interim hearings, as I say, important times in the, 24% uh, of cases, the registrar would determine on the papers um, that there was, should be no access to the child, usually of, because of violence. When we looked at the post-reform uh, judgments, unreported usually, the figure was 4%. Now this goes back to what I was mentioning before, the emphasis given on the right of contact. These would not be any different cases. Unfortunately, society hasn't changed. We're just as violent. Uh, we have just as many incidents in our post-separation families. So there's a very dramatic change which has been continued uh, through the life of this research project in contact being maintained and the fear is that it's being maintained in circumstances where there may be serious uh, concerns about the safety of the children. When we look at final hearings, and this is the pre-reform final hearing. Sorry, they're very similar anyway. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the finals in the pre-reform were 21% no, no access no, and 23% no contact, same thing. So what you're seeing at final hearings, they're not the same group of people, they're a much smaller group of people at final hearings because as I say, many people accept the interim decision. But at that stage, we're getting an average of 21 or 22 per cent where the circumstances are such that the, at that stage the judge is saying no contact, no access. So I think that really does heighten the, the concern we have between these contradictory provisions. Just a couple more points. I think one of the other issues is that there have been expectations on behalf, on the part of particularly fathers, that shared parenting does mean either equal time or much more participation. And many of the lawyers we interviewed said that fathers came to them as soon as the act was passed, and there was quite a bit of publicity at the time, and said, you know, now I can have my joint custody. Uh, so there's, I think one of the reasons we're getting such a lot of contravention applications is that fathers' expectations have been incorrectly high about the role that they will play in the lives of their children. Now, this may be right or it may be wrong, but in terms of what life is like for single parent families, uh, whilst we know that many fathers don't exercise the opportunities of contact, those who do, and where there's some problem or where they want to play a more major role in their children's lives get very distressed. So I think there are incorrect expectations. I think the contradictory provisions in the Act have contributed greatly um, to that. Um, I won't go into it because of the time, but we have quite a few quotes from solicitors about how the provisions were a SOP and how it was really meant to deflect away from the real issues um, that was face were facing parents. One solicitor actually said to us, we're having much more fun now because there's a lot more to fight about. So I think um, that was one of the lawyers who was probably making the most use of our specific issues provisions. Um, I'll finish now, I, th I think, by just in terms of the terminology itself, which as I say is, is, is a fairly minor player in this, but uh, one of my co-researchers told me only last week that she was interviewing a, re-interviewing a solicitor that she talked to earlier in our project. And he remarked that uh, many judges and solicitors and fellow lawyers of all types are still using the old terminology. So it, it hasn't really permeated, but of course, more commonly, it's the parents who are still using um, the, the old language of custody and access. In fact, he remarked to her that when a parent does refer to residence, contact, or specific issues, you know immediately that these are voracious litigators. <laughs> Thank you very much.
I'd invite uh, Tom and Carol to uh, make any observations they wish on the Australian experience uh, as it pertains to Canada. Tom? Um, I realize you haven't had a chance to uh, read um, the Australian paper, but I thought it was uh, extremely interesting and uh, very uh, detailed empirical uh, study of what has happened in the four or five years, I guess, is since Australia has had its legislation. I, I think what sometimes we forget is that um, our broader societal uh, important trends dictate the change in the wording. And as a practicing lawyer, it is simply more difficult to resolve matters using the words custody and access, which really emanated from the 17th century. Uh, I am not surprised that the actual result is much different, but I ask you, Margaret Harrison, does it really make any difference? Is it not easier to uh, negotiate uh, and resolve the problems using your new terminology, or is that a myth? I think, quite honestly, it's a myth. I really don't think you can change people's issues and attitudes and disputes and concerns by language. Uh, I, th I think it's helping the people who would have helped anyway, those who are on a, on a path to being amicable, they're fine. They would have always been. I think it's the, it's the disputants that are the problem and they've probably got more to, as I say, to fight over. So the answer's no. Yeah, I had two, two uh, topics to comment on, and, uh, and the paper is extremely helpful, and I'm going to send it to the federal government to make sure that they see it when they're looking at this. Um, one thing is it was really interesting to hear um, news that, you know, Australia also had a big crisis in legal aid, that this affected the conduct in their family law courts, because everybody in this room knows we had a big crisis in legal aid in 1996 and continue to have a family law crisis. But what was uh, also interesting was that the article in the September issue of the CBA National Magazine about the uh, increase in unrepresented litigants in the Superior Court in Ontario, I don't know how many of you saw it, it said that since 1995 there had been a 500 percent increase in unrepresented parties in the Superior Court in Ontario, not all of which were uh, family law and not all of which could be um, con uh, said to be a result of the cuts in legal aid. And the author of the article did some interviews with unrepresented litigants. Um, they said in part that their decision to be unrepresented was due to their confidence that they could do just as good a job as a lawyer, uh, in part borne out by American television. <laughs> uh, and also the, the people that, he, that the interviewer spoke to the article author spoke to were not only people who would have been financially eligible for legal aid, but people who had um, more than enough money to hire their own lawyer and were making a conscious choice not to hire a lawyer. And he also did interviews post-case to find out their satisfaction with the process, and the majority of them indicated that they were either totally satisfied or very satisfied with how the results of the case came out. Um, even though they had been unrepresented by a lawyer. Now, this is a very serious st statement for the legal profession. Um, the other thing that is very clear in the paper that is very disturbing to me is the consequences for assaulted women of these kinds of changes, which the, unfortunately the Joint Committee completely you know, and intentionally chose to ignore. The paper makes it clear that assaulted women are put at risk by the temporary orders that are made in Australia that seem to be corrected, quote unquote, in the final orders, but as all of us know, how many people actually get to a final order? Very few in family law. So this is a very serious consequence. And just in closing, I just refer to the very last paragraph in the paper, which says that the most widely known characteristic of the reforms, the, the changes in terminology, have proven to be the least influential aspect of the reforms, together with the introduction of parenting plans. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is going to be Dr. Clive Chamberlain. I uh, 
I would like to tell you a little bit about Clive, but uh, in looking through the bio sketches, I noticed that Clive didn't bother uh, writing one. Uh, Clive's going to speak, uh, and I'm not sure what he does. Maybe he can start off by telling us what, what he's currently doing. I, I do know that, that I, I think I asked him to do an assessment report about 1991 on a case that I'm still waiting for the report on. <laughs> of course, the children have now grown up, and it really doesn't matter, which I think was Clive's plan to begin with. Clive uh, will be speaking today about uh, best interest from an assessor's perspective. Dr. Clive Chamberlain. That was quick. I just noticed that uh, I stopped my speaking about two minutes ago, according to the schedule. Uh, Harold's right. Um, he's still waiting for that assessment report. I think uh, Jeffrey Wilson represented the other party. And the last time I heard about it was a call from uh, uh, Madam Justice Spiegel, she got me on the phone uh, from court demanding that I produce the report. And uh, I think I went, I think I uh, realized that I'd better at least go myself. I didn't have a report. Um, my job was to explain why a report was not a good idea, uh, why some conflicts are better left unresolved, uh, why sometimes smoke, uh, throwing smoke in the air and leaving people with the illusion that perhaps at least at the end of uh, one's life or in the next world there could be a solution is better than coming down hard on one side or the other and having a loser causing an awful lot of mischief. Um, I've, been, uh, I've been in this business for about 35 years. Um, I've been able to stay in the business because I only take about six or seven referrals a year, but, I, but it's, been, uh, it's been a number of years. Um, when I started, it was, uh, it was assessments that you were asked to do. And, uh, you know, you were, you were sent uh, a question. You had to resolve or make recommendations about custody and access. And uh, it, was, it was fairly evident after a few fumbling efforts that that was a bit of a mugs game. The idea that something could be tidied up and uh, an assessment completed, uh, that there was some kind of uh, clear resolution that was possible and that then people would walk off hand in hand into the sunset or not hand in hand but at least uh, that the matter would be dealt with. Then of course there was the, the period when uh, we were all uh, to do mediation, either open or closed. Um, that, that was also predicated on the assumption that somehow uh, conflicts could be resolved and that there was an end point beyond which things would uh, more or less uh, settle down. Now I should, I should at least uh, um, coach my comments by, by letting you know that uh, I, you know, the blind men and the elephant thing, I have the tail of the elephant or the, or the trunk of the elephant, I'm not sure which, but the kinds of cases that I've tended to deal with are are not your average garden variety case, which settles without lawyers or, uh, or people in my business at all. Um, I tend to get referred uh, nasty cases that have been uh, hacked to pieces by other people in my business, lawyers, courts, and so on. So uh, it's, the, it's the high conflict uh, issues that, uh, that I've tended to uh, address. Um, and as I've worked my th way through this, uh, this process, I've, I've come to think of my involvement with many of these things, not as an assessment, uh, not as mediation, uh, sometimes arbitration, but really as a process. I, in preparation for this, I pulled out a bunch of files of cases that I've been working with over the years, and there's a surprising number of cases that I've made no report at all. It wasn't just Harold's. Um, I've done it with a number of them. I remember particularly one case in which uh, one of the protagonists was a, a very paranoid guy, and I was worried that uh, if he actually lost, ultimately lost, that uh, he'd get his revenge in, in a way that none of us could predict or, uh, or prevent, and that the best thing uh, in that particular instance was, uh, uh, as I say, to smoke, uh, throw smoke in the air and to, uh, and to resist the temptation to believe that there was closure. Everybody talks about closure. Nothing closes except death. Um, 
we go on and on and we, we hurt and our wounds continue. And uh, I think that's something that we, we don't want to know and we want closure, uh, but uh, in my experience, it, um, it, it doesn't happen. Uh, so my agenda for the most part is to, uh, is to try to reduce the thing that hurts most kids, which is uh, ongoing conflict. And uh, very often, that means that the conflict has to be managed in an ongoing way. One can do some things to set a framework or uh, create a structure that may uh, limit some of that conflict, but uh, it, it, uh, it needs some, some agent. Uh, sometimes agents can be found within the family, in the natural life of, uh, of the uh, protagonist, but sometimes it needs to be an outsider that, that hangs in and uh, even if it's only a phone call at Christmas to uh, make a comment about uh, some crisis that's arisen over, uh, you know, who, who goes on the plane or who pays for the tickets, that sort of thing. But these things, uh, these things can't come up and can't always be anticipated by uh, an assessment or a parenting plan, uh, that's, that sort of thing. The other thing about uh, children's interests, it, it always interests me to, to hear, you know, to, to think about this best interests idea. Um, if it's true that uh, conflict between people that the kid loves uh, is toxic to the kid, then the, the, the child's interests really are the interests of everybody in the conflict. Um, and so, uh, when you're engaged in trying to address yourself to a kid's interests, one of their paramount interests is making sure that the interests of mom and dad and grandparents and everybody else that matters are also paid attention to. So it's kind of derivative. It's a mirror. It's not something that you can uh, clearly separate from, uh, from every, everything else. Um, I th in reflecting on what I've learned, it seems to me that it, I haven't learned an awful lot in 35 years. There, there are some things, though, that I think we should unlearn. Uh, in spite of uh, advances we've made both in legislation and in practice and in uh, our understanding of psychology and sociology and all of that sort of thing, we, we do tend, I think, to cling to uh, romantic views of the family, uh, sentimental uh, attachments to our notions of, uh, of uh, what it is to be a person, what it is to be uh, a member of a family. Um, I think it's worth rec uh, recognizing that the smallest functional unit of human existence isn't the individual. It's not even the family. It's probably closer to the clan. None of us can function autonomously. Families can't even function autonomously. And there's a lot of danger in wrenching out the individual and thinking about the individual as a separable unit, even conceptually, or even the family uh, as, a, uh, as a separate unit. Uh, we exist uh, and we even define ourselves in relation to our relationships with others. And, and this, this is a widening circle, and so we can't really exist as separate individuals. Another uh, sentimental um, notion that I think causes a lot of trouble is the idea that truth can be known. Uh, assessors are often uh, asked to figure out what, what's the truth, what really happens. That is also a mugs game. Uh, very often, efforts to determine the truth cause more harm than uh, the, the value that, uh, that uh, they generate. This isn't just true in, in the very obvious ones where uh, an effort to determine whether a child had been sexually abused or not leaves the child sexually abused because of the inquiry. Uh, there are many areas in which efforts to determine the truth steer you away from uh, wise outcomes and uh, uh, thoughtful uh, solutions. So I think it's important that, that both anybody involved in these things, and in particular the families, uh, understand that, uh, that there are many truths. I mean, the, the 20th century novel has been telling us this all along, and even physics uh, has disabused itself of the idea that we can know everything about any particular thing, and certainly this is true in our business. 
Another myth or, or sentimental view that uh, causes a lot of mischief is the idea that there is justice in the world. Um, I think we have to understand, and we don't often, we, we think we live in a society where everybody follows the rules and where good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. And obviously that's only grade C movies that that, that happens in. Uh, but it's amazing to me how many people come to courts and lawyers with the confident expectation that justice will be done, that somehow there is wisdom somewhere, uh, and that there's a solution to their problem. And it's amazing to me in this century particularly how anybody can believe that, but they do. Another myth that's common is that courts can compel behavior. Fascinating how often one sees a lengthy process, lots of money spent on it, lots of pain. Uh, ultimately, a court orders something, and you know, within six weeks or six months, the whole thing is stale dated. Something else happens, it doesn't happen, people don't behave the way the, uh, uh, the, court, uh, the court ordered. So that's another illusion that people coming into these processes often, uh, often have and, and causes them trouble. Other uh, myths, you know, the, the issue that access and support are, are separable uh, is, a, is a, a really risky notion. Um, I, think, I think that people who are involved in, uh, in uh, dealing with many of these disputes need to go back and read uh, the discourses by Machiavelli or, or even Henry Kissinger. Everything is connected to everything else. Um, it, we're dealing with real politics here. We're not just dealing with sentimental notions. And although it would be nice to believe that people could deal with the kids on, on one plane and then deal with money on another, that sounds great, but it doesn't, it rarely, rarely happens. Uh, these things are connected whether we like it or not. We can have all our rules about it, but they are connected and we need, to, we need also to keep that into, uh, in, in our minds. Um, The idea that things uh, that are broken can be fixed is another, uh, another uh, bit of nonsense that causes a great deal of trouble. Uh, when, when a marriage, it's like, you know, the Humpty Dumpty, and uh, people go to, uh, to courts and people in my business expecting some kind of outcome that uh, will fix things up, and it, 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 seldom, it seldom happens. I think, though, the, the, uh, the important, the really important notion uh, here is the, is, the, uh, is the issue that a child's interests uh, are connected to everybody else's interests and that one has to really, if one is going to find a solution that manages conflict in, a, in an ongoing way, one has to be clearly aware of everybody's interests in the peace and like Henry Kissinger, paying careful attention to all of those and trying to, uh, trying to address them. Um, I've saved you some time. I have no, uh, Clive obviously represents mainstream thinking on these issues. <laughs> I, I, I've heard a lot from you, Clive, about the, all the, the, the myths. So, uh, I mean, do parenting plans ultimately matter? I think uh, what you heard this morning was right. I think the process, in working out a parenting plan is really important. I think parenting plans are great. A lot of people, uh, it works well for a lot of people, but the process is more important than, uh, than the piece of paper. And the last thing that was said, I think one of the comments was that every parenting plan needs to have a conflict resolution clause. I think that's absolutely critical and it acknowledges the notion that these things don't end, that they go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And, and in your view, the most important factor, or single most important factor, is to avoid conflict. That's what you tell parents that come to see you for an assessment. Yeah, as long as we recognize that there is no fundamental principle here, there are lots of re there are lots of issues that uh, have to be put against that. But I would think that uh, in the vast majority of cases, the most toxic thing that happens is the ongoing conflict. And, and what about when you have the uh, the, 
the parent who comes in says that uh, they want to have the Sunday overnight, although it appears that the modern thinking is that they should have a Sunday overnight to avoid conflict, uh, or they're arguing about the one or two nights uh, of the month. How do you deal with that in terms of the, the father who's insistent upon having the extra time? What do you tell him? Well, I mean, there are some times when the, uh, when the conflict that's generated by uh, that kind of thing is more corrosive than the issue that the father is raising. So sometimes it's best uh, to cave into dad and give him a l move the yardsticks a little bit because otherwise the conflict would cause more harm than the inconvenience or irritation of a uh, access schedule that looks less than uh, ideal. The cave, other cave into sorry cave into dad or cave into mom and that's well, cave into whoever or cave into wh whoever I mean the issue it, it seems to me that the issue there is that uh, if you have a if you have something that is so important to one of the uh, protagonists that if you if you don't address it in in some way and give them some and yield something to them uh, that you'll have just ongoing conflict then you have to ask yourself you know is it worth it? Uh, now, obviously, if, you're, if, if I'm involved in a situation like this, I'll spend some time hitting Dad over the head with uh, horror stories about the consequences of pushing his point and all of that sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, um, you've got to get something that, uh, that, that reduces conflict. And otherwise, you've got kids in the middle of a battlefield. R regardless of, of what one might consider to be the better arrangement? Yeah. Yep. And, and how do the kids turn out in that situation? You've been doing this uh, long enough. Does it much matter? Does it much matter whether dad has a midweek overnight on, on a Wednesday night or whether there's shared parenting? Does, does it matter to the kids? Do they end up any different? No, I, I don't think it matters whether dad sees his kids every other weekend and every Thursday night for, uh, uh, for lunch. I mean, all you have to do is think of your own families. Uh, very often, one of the things I tell uh, uh, these clients is that they're anxious to spend more time with their kids than I ever spent with my kids. Uh, on weekends with my kids, my kids were off doing other things, and if I got a chance to see them, it was very brief. I wasn't spending huge amounts of time with them. Um, the minute you get a separation and you uh, uh, have a competition over time, suddenly time becomes critical when it, in the life of ordinary families, is far, far less so. So no, I don't, think, uh, I don't think those things are terribly important. I think what's important is that a kid feels that his parents love him or her, that he can love them without feeling guilty or disloyal to anybody, and that uh, he keeps in touch or she keeps in touch. But the amount of time I don't think is uh, awfully important at all. After all, you know, uh, there are lots of families where uh, one or other parents uh, are away for significant periods of time from various uh, you know, through, due to various uh, accidents of life, and uh, I don't think we have any evidence that uh, kids who are adequately nurtured and who feel that they're loved and uh, don't have to feel guilty about loving do any have any harm to them. And uh, lastly, then, what about the uh, the parents who come to you arguing about uh, shared decision making? Do you think that ends up mattering much? And, and how do you deal with that when it when it turns out to be the last piece? I usually try and take them separately and get them to read Machiavelli um, and get them to understand that, that in the long run their interests are best protected by worrying about the needs of their enemy. Um, you know, that they're, it's well known that if you put your enemy in a corner or you disadvantage your enemy, uh, they're going to get back at you. And so people have to... It, if, if you have conflict, you may as well make it explicit that there is conflict and not, not uh, succumb to the sentimental notion, notion that it'll go away. So what you do is you, uh, you make them more effective bargainers, you make them more effective uh, advancers of their interests, but intelligently, not, not stupidly. Uh, and, and usually that, that kind of uh, approach where you're coaching both sides to manage the conflict they have with the other uh, results in a more structured conflict and very often a more intelligently conducted one to the advantage of kids often. Without there being any uh, division in terms of, of decisions? Sure. 
Okay, uh, thanks Clive for uh, here. <laughs> Our uh, last speaker before lunch is uh, Professor Roly Thompson, who uh, has been teaching at uh, Dalhousie since 1982, family law, uh, civil procedure, and evidence. And uh, he has also practiced uh, family law and was the uh, director for about six years of the uh, Dalhousie uh, Legal Aid Clinic. And he's going to do something for us called the uh, SCC Wrap. And uh, since he clerked at the SCC, he knows whereof he wraps. So take it away, Roly. First, I, I, I want to tell you I'm more comfortable speaking underneath a television set than over there, based on what's happened so far this morning. Um, first, I want you to realize I know I'm, quote, eating into your lunch, which makes me, and I hate to use the word eating at this point, but I'm very conscious of that. The paper just got a lot shorter, all right? Um, Harold, it was Harold's idea to call it the Supreme Court of Canada rap. It was not my idea, all right? I want to understand that right away. I did have to work rap into the title. My teenage sons were of the view that the word rap and I were utterly inconsistent, all right? <laughs> Based on my life experience and my age, they thought that perhaps I should hum a few bars from Beatles' tune or maybe even croon a Carpenter's song. But not rap. You're not getting rap, all right? So um, what I am going to give you is a very quick speech. I'll talk faster. That seems to be the solution that some of us have adopted this morning. Um, <laughs> Over the last two decades, the Supreme Court of Canada has extended the best interest of the child analysis into every conceivable nook and cranny of child custody law, child, law affecting a child generally. With each advance, though, what happens is the court strips more and more out of that test. What's left is a test concerned only with individual justice. And this on the first page of my paper, tab seven, for those of you who want to read the rest of what I'm not going to say, all right? What's left is individual justice the best interests of the particular child and the particular circumstances of the case according to Justice McLaughlin and Gordon and Gortz. Individual justice. No presumptions, no procedural burdens, no adversarial formalities, just case by case by case decision making. That's it. Finally this year, I think the Supreme Court of Canada reached an inevitable destination with its approach, which is the DH versus HM case, difficult case, four-year-old boy, tough issues. They didn't even give reasons, all right? They eventually gave fragmentary reasons later. I think it's just a very small step after all from saying each case is unique to saying cases don't need reasons either. That's the, that's the ultimate step, I think, of the court's analysis. In, in effect, what you've got is, a, is something that amounts in the DH case to a judicial coin toss. Um, it's not hard to attack the best interest of the child principle for its indeterminacy, its subjectivity, its vagueness, although I'm surprised so few people have so far today. Anyway, I thought I'd pick that one up. Um, I want to take a slightly different tack in the few minutes I have available, he said bitterly. Um, my point here, and it has to be a very, very small point, and I have to say to Nick, it's a very small point, I can't make a career out of it, all right? Very small, <laughs> is that the court has sacrificed the interests of all children at the altar of the one child on a case-by-case -case basis. And it's only the best interest of this one child, they say, that must be considered. Um, they, refuse, they have refused, I would suggest, to consider the premises or the consequences of that one decision, and the result has been unintended, counterintuitive, and sometimes perverse results for the system as a whole. Now, I should say, right at this point, I think the court's right. I, 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 I think they should be protected from ill-considered intemperate criticism. This is considered intemperate criticism, all right? <laughs> and because it's a short paper, I couldn't put in all the lawyerly qualifications. What's happened in the Supreme Court of Canada, just to leap through the cases, page two on, is the Supreme Court applied first the, in the early 80s or the mid 80s, the best interest test to disagreements or contests over custody between natural parents and adoptive parents. Um, it was only a short step after that then to, to extend the best interest test to a disagreement where one of the strangers was the state, and that was in a child welfare case from New Brunswick, CGC. Um, then you had the Young case and uh, the MC case, which is uh, initials, I have trouble with initials, but uh, the MC case, which is a child protection case, they were both decided in 93 and 94. Young, of course, the, dealing with the issue of access and religious freedom. MC, a case dealing with status review under the Ontario Child and Family, Service, Child and Family Services Act. Um, in 1996, we had the Gordon and Gwards case. We'll spend more time on that this afternoon, um, those issues anyway. 
And in the 1998 protection case called L. Amitz, another case from New Brunswick, all protection cases seem to come from New Brunswick, with occasional ones from Ontario. Um, the court found a power to order access after wardship, um, after permanent wardship, despite the language of the New Brunswick statute. And this is an interesting rule of statutory interpretation. Statutory interpretation should begin, said Justice Gonchet, from the premise that the court will have the power to do what is in the best interest of this particular child unless it's specifically closed off and clearly closed off by the statute. That's where we've come to as a consequence. And finally, we have the DH case. Just to go back for a second, once upon a time we had a case called Racine and Woods back in the 80s, okay. a difficult case in which the court dealt with the issues of bonding and Aboriginal heritage, and in that case, and also a natural parent. And the court struggled in that case and said that, that as you see the quote on page four, that in the end, the, uh, the, the bonding of the child won out over Aboriginal her heritage in that case, essentially. <laughs> 16 years later, we had the DH case this spring, 1999. We don't even have that kind of struggling. Okay? And that, I would suggest, is how far we've come down the road of each case is unique. Each case is decided in the best interest of this particular child at this particular moment in time. The last time the court tried to give any explanation of what best interests actually meant, and you'll all recognize this passage on page five of my paper, it's that long quote, long abstract quote from Justice McIntyre in King and Lowe. It's the last time we heard them try to, in some capsulized sense, tell us what best interests meant. Um, we re when you look at Racine and King and Lowe, both cases you say involving young children, you say, well, it's a reasonable conclusion that in very young children, Bonding or attachments given dominant effect within the best interest test. That's what leads out of there. In the MC case, a child protection case, same thing again. Um, and that involved, of course, an immigrant mother who had, her child had spent five or seven years in foster care. And bonding in that case won out. It won out over systemic delay, over trial judgments in, the fa in favor of the mother. It won, over, won out over the very structure of the Children and Family Services Act, it seemed. Um, and in that case, the court used the traditional best interest test from parent-parent cases and natural parent-parent cases and applied it in the child protection setting. Now, you have, I, we, we have to understand that an emphasis of that kind of bond, upon bonding as the operative concern um, within that test does end up placing a parent at a disadvantage in respect of child protection matters where a child has gone into care even temporarily. Um, but best interest is very good at one thing, and we can see it at work through these cases. It's a great leveler. It puts everybody in the same position on a level playing field, all contestants for custody. It's also a great leveler in the sense that it wipes out all content from the test. That's what best interest has served. In Young, we discovered that best interest can even be used to cut down charter rights because best interest has become something like a supra-constitutional value to which all constitutional values bend. Okay. And then you have Gordon Gewertz, in which uh, Justice McLaughlin gave her most expansive reading yet to best interests, basically ruthlessly individualized decision making, case by case. No presumptions, it's an attack on presumptions this decision. Um, not only substantively, but also procedurally. It's an, it's an attack on any attempt to, to actually frame or structure the process. Everyone bears an evidential burden. Everyone bears a burden to bring something forward. And, and the quote at the bottom of page six here is, but Parliament did not entrust the court with the best interests of most children. It entrusted the court with the best interests of the particular child whose custody arrangements fall to be determined. Each child is unique. And then we get a list of factors. You know the list of factors, you can all recite it. Um, the DH case is the final straw. That's the case that involved um, a boy who had spent three of his four years with his Aboriginal grandfather. The contest was between the Aboriginal grandfather and the adoptive grandparents from who had moved to Connecticut. Um, in that case, the court made very little reference to the issue of attachment and bonding. Um, the decision seems to run contrary to every single other decision on the court's part involving very young children. Court makes, gives only a nod, if that, to the issue of Aboriginal heritage. They talk about deference to the trial judge in this case. Then you say, well, if that's true, then whatever happened in the MC case? Okay. There, the trial decision was in the mother's favor. That case, same thing again. Why didn't she get the benefit of deference to the trial judge? So, there is one factor I would suggest that wends its way through all these cases. One factor, and that's the issue of class, social class. I think that in every case, the wealthier, higher class claimant is granted custody, uh, perhaps most strikingly in that DH case. Uh, review the cases, and I think those, those decisions are infected with a subtle but 
steady notion of class bias, which is hidden by the neutral nature of the best interest test. So I'm going to finish this off very quickly. Best interest test has proven to be a very powerful engine of destruction in child custody law, for good and ill in the hands of the Supreme Court of Canada. It has been used to clear away archaic old common law rules. It's been used to, to clear away gender preferences, first for fathers, then for mothers. It's been used to bend statutory custody rules, um, sometimes beyond recognition. It has been used to, to alter the substance of child protection legislation. It has been used to even cut down charter rights. At the same time, what's happened is the test itself has become more focused and more focused upon one child at a time, this particular child, this particular case. And in my view, that undervalues the interests of all children. I'm just going to run through how, just the headings, that's all you're getting. You're getting to lunch. Number one, it discourages settlement. The best interest test as approached currently by the Supreme Court of Canada, the kind of individualized justice. It discourages settlement. It encourages, enlarges, and delays custody litigation. It ignores time as a systemic problem, time, real time in children's lives. It undercuts child protection legislation by treating the state and the parent as if they were two equal claimants. Also ignores the, um, the substructure that child protection legislation has built up to define systemic concerns about children, their interests, the proper role of state and family. Um, the, uh, the approach of the court at the present time dismisses systemic effects as concerns about parental rights and parental wrongs. There's a little screen there about that. Um, and also, it hides or permits discrimination. And that's a fundamental concern I have with the best interest test on its face. Um, it wasn't necessary for the court to develop such an extreme, individualized version of best interests. Um, child protection legislation offered the opportunity to the court to take a broader systemic view. They rejected it. Um, even the language of the Divorce Act doesn't have to produce this kind of an extremist approach. Um, an open-ended best interest test could have incorporated um, intermediate premises, presumptions of some kind, uh, but the court made a conscious policy choice not to do that. I'm saying simply it's time for the court to reconsider that, to reconsider the consequences of its individual decisions for all children, and to alter the law as a consequence of that. Thank you. I, I, I don't care what your kids say, Rolly. That was a great rap. Uh, we're going to break now for lunch, and uh, we're starting. We're going to start sharp at two with the judges' panel. So please be here on time. Thank you very much.